Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to our first Councilor at Large meeting for 2019. There are only a few of you here. However, this will be broadcast on Brockton Community Access. And we appreciate you taking the time to come by tonight. We enjoy this. Uh, Councilor Court can't be here tonight because he is severely under the weather. But to my left, your right, I have Councilor at Large Robert Sullivan, and to my right, uh, in your left, I have our newly elected Council President and Councilor at Large Moises Rodriguez. And joining us up here is also Ward 3 Councilor Dennis Ianeri, who is the longest serving member of the City Council. Uh, we have a couple of other people that we'll ask to speak tonight. Uh, we have Captain Mark Picaro from the Police Department, and we have Officer Bill Healy from the Police Department. So uh, this is really an opportunity for us to hear from you. Uh, we enjoy this part of politics, and we think it's important to be around and be visible, not just during election time when we ask for your support, but during the year, so that we can be kind of a sounding board as to what's going on. So with that, I would like to introduce Councilor Moises Rodriguez, our new council president, to offer a few remarks. Gee, I didn't know I was going to get introduced. Uh, but anyways, I, I just want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Um, as I've always said, Brockton goes as far as its citizens take it. Uh, we can say whatever we want to say as far as the elected folks are concerned, but it's you folks that make this city what it is. And I can tell you, uh, from working with my colleagues in the council and other members of our government, uh, we're here to hear. We're here to listen, uh, but also to hear what you're saying, because it's not just that listen, but we need to hear you. And our intent is to uh, hold a lot of these meetings. I think we're going to do four a year, uh, break them up every three months or so in uh, various parts uh, of the city, but we're going we're gonna to keep coming. And we're going to keep coming. Uh, uh, because we want to know what's going on in the uh, in the community, and the only way we can do that is to make these uh, these uh, provide you with these opportunities of these meetings to come and voice your concern, good or bad. Uh, and together, I think we can uh, we can do uh, what we can to make Brockton even a better place for all of us. Thank you. And now, Councillor Lange, Robert Sullivan. Well, first of all, thank you for being here, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, kind of a cold, rainy night, and uh, you know we we uh, we enjoy these meetings. Uh, probably two different legislative sessions ago, I proposed this as a council at large. Now, the ward councils, like Council Yanieri, have different ward meetings, but you know I came up with the idea, and, and to the credit of all my colleagues as council at large, they said absolutely. Now, some people say, well, politicians are only seen during election years. In our case, as Council Lodge, we've been doing this for a while, and we do it all different uh, around the city, the four quarters. So we typically do it at the different middle schools, or some people still call them junior highs. Uh, so you know, we'll do north, we'll do east, you know, do south, and we're at west tonight. But really, I think the whole basis is to hear from the people that elect us, the people that we serve, the taxpayers of the city of Brockton. Good, bad, and different, whatever your views are, you know, that's why we serve and that's why we're here tonight. So I just want to thank each and every one of you for being here. And, uh, you know, Captain Picaro and, and Officer Healy and Derek Duarte from the police. It's very important to have a collaborative approach as the elected officials and with public uh, law enforcement and public safety. So I know they're always, you know, ready, willing, and able to answer any questions, much like we are. So I, I look forward to, uh, to a good evening. Thank you. I'm glad my colleague mentioned Darren Duarte from the police department. We appreciate him taking time to be here. And we, we thank BCA for filming this. And Councilor Ianeri, anything you'd like to uh, offer? You know what it is, a politician sees a microphone, you know how it is. <laughs> exactly. I'll, I'll fill in for uh, Councilor Darren Court. Well, the resemblance isn't the same, but uh, in any case, um, uh, I do appreciate my uh, Councilor Lodge colleagues and, uh, of course, my uh, a new City Council President for allowing me to sit here uh, with them this evening and, and partake as, as well. And um, I think as Councilor Sullivan said, he, he was the one that uh, started the, this process of uh, having City Council at large meetings and come out into the to the district and to the uh, four uh, uh, middle schools, uh, north, south, east, and west, and, and uh, have always been received very well. And 
I'm sure this evening we probably would have seen some more people, but inclement weather can hold people back. But at the same time, um, they'll be uh, able to view this when they, when they watch a cable show. Um, but again, as he mentioned, um, one thing I've always done in the uh, 16 years that I've been a, a member of the City Council uh, was to um, hold board meetings, which I, I do at least two to three a year uh, in Ward 3 area, which I'll be holding one sometime probably uh, in March. And uh, again, they are always very well attended and it, it brings people together and, and we're correct. And, and I think um, when it's mentioned that sometimes people feel they only see their uh, representatives when it's election time, it's, it's not true. We, we all try to get out there, uh, even our other uh, colleagues as well, to uh, make sure that they uh, you know, are, are partaking in, in, in within their neighborhoods and uh, listening to some of the issues that uh, are before us. So, with that being said, I, I look I look forward to um, to listening this evening and to you um, people as well. And um, I'm sure you'll uh, you'll find this very informational. So, thank you, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, between now and approximately 7:15, we're going to go over some issues that we think you'll find interesting. And the first one, uh, which has been fairly prominent in the city, is the implementation of the marijuana retail sales, marijuana cultivation, marijuana dispensary uh, issues that have been ongoing. Councillor Sullivan is chair of ordinance, and Councillor Rodriguez and I also served on that committee. And we literally spent meeting after meeting after meeting going over not only the state regulations, which were about 100 pages, but also comprehensive uh, regulations and zoning for the city. So if Bob would give us an overview of what we've done and where we are, I think it'll be pretty informative. Thank you, Wynn. So um, I think Council Fowler just summed it up. I mean, we spent hours in, uh, working with our legislative council. Uh, a lot of people don't know it, but the city solicitor, the law department at City Hall represents the legal interests of the city of Brockton. But the city council, the elected 11 of us, have our own attorney, legislative council, attorney Shannon Resnick. Um, we worked with Shannon, we worked in collaboration with the law department led by Phil Nezzarella, attorney Nezzarella. Um, we had two uh, public forums uh, where we wanted to get input. Um, we talked to the DA uh, and his assistant, former Judge Rick Savignano, came before us. Um, the five members last year on the, on the City Council's Ordinance Committee with myself as Chairman, Councilor Fowell, Councilor Rodriguez, Councilor Monaghan, and Ward 1 Councilor uh, Tim Cruz. We had seven or eight of these meetings. Um, we, we looked at different legislation uh, from outside the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We looked at Colorado and the like. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, maybe because of my legal training, um, I did not want to rush it. I didn't think it was the right thing to do. Several years ago, when medical marijuana was coming to the city of Brockton, and Councilor Ian Erie was, was on the Ordinance Committee with me, and I chaired it at that time as well, you know, we spent over a year trying to figure out where should this go? Where should this go? Originally, it was thought that it was going to go up in the village section of Brockton, and Council, then Councilor um, Dubois, now State Rep Dubois, said, no, I don't want it there. So Dennis, I mean, we spoke to the police chief at that time, Manny Gomes, the fire chief, uh, you know, of Richie Francis. Uh, we spoke to doctors, and we, we spent a lot of time on that. And then ultimately it was decided that we would go to West Chestnut Street, and we did an overlay district. So right now, if you drove up there right now, there's two medical marijuana facilities. One is operational, okay, in good health. It's been there for a while now. And the other one is going to be starting. It's already been sanctioned, and you can see the building on the corner of Liberty Street where the post office is in the back. Liberty and West Chestnut is going to be the second medical marijuana. Under the law, it, it says if you're a medical marijuana distributor, then you automatically get to do recreational. Okay? So the city of Brockton has to allow eight licenses for recreational marijuana. Now, you take the two plus six to get to the eight. The proposal was, was originally presented to us um, that there was going to be a thought to try to put them all in the core of the city, the downtown area. Uh, you know, the five of us said that doesn't make any sense. Let's kind of work around it and see where it is. And we spent months and months and months and months on this. We also, as a full city council, passed what they call a moratorium. It, it puts a hold on everything in the city of Brockton. 
until we can do our final dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Originally, the moratorium was to expire the last day of December 2018. To the wisdom of the council, we extended it for one month through January because we expected the uh, planning board to meet in early January on a, a thing called 40A, Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40A. It allows for a mechanism for a municipality, a city, or a town to change zoning. We're a city form of government here under our charter, so we, we as the subcommittee of the city council, the five members, finally was able to come out with a recommendation back to the council, okay? And then that also goes to planning board. That was December 27th. Now, people are saying, you might read the Enterprise and see what people are saying, you drag your feet, you're anti-business. That's, that's not factual. You violated the law. That is 100% inaccurate. What the city council did is we've extended this moratorium for another month till the end of February. Now, people are saying, well, that it's costing money to the city of Brockton. It's not costing a dime to the city of Brockton because, quite honestly, with a moratorium effect, they can't do business, number one. Number two, the licensing zoning hasn't passed. Um, now, I will say that there are potential applicants that want to open up these recreational around the city. There's someone on Pearl Street, there's someone up in the village. So under their law guidelines, they have to have these public hearings and they've been having meetings, some at the Holiday Inn at Westgate Mall. It's all a little premature because zoning hasn't passed. And what has been forwarded back to the full council by the five of us um, is a recommendation from five, not 11, just five. We we're able to then vet it out. There could be a council from Ward 3 or Ward 2 or whatever, Ward 6, that wants to make uh, an amendment on the floor. So there is still a legislative mechanism process in place. Our expectation is that we're going to be able to have it finalized this month, being February 2019. Um, at that time, the city council and the members of the city council, and I happened to chair ordinance again in 2019, and Wynn's on there as well, and um, Moses as president isn't on it because he's, he's by virtue of being president, but we're, we're taking it very serious, um, but people are saying, well, where is it and where are these shops gonna open? Well, we expect to have that formalized this month and then a potential applicant would have to come to the city council. We're gonna be the licensing authority for these medical marijuana, I mean these recreational marijuana licenses. So it's, it's all a little premature to say, well, someone's gonna open up here and there and everywhere. We don't know, quite honestly, but we do know there are very strong advocates that want to open up in Brockton. And, you know, we hear that, we understand that, but we're not gonna sell the citizens that we represent short. We're not gonna go willy-nilly into this, we haven't. And I can stand here before you and say, I'm proud of the four other gentlemen that served with me because we've done it the right way. And ultimately, I mean, I, I'm anti-marijuana, I don't smoke pot, never have, I got three little kids, but it passed in the ballot. So it is a reality, it is coming here, and we just gonna need to make sure that it's done in a proper way, working with law enforcement and, and uh, Again, I, I, I think that the city council is doing everything that it should be doing, and I will say that other municipalities in the Commonwealth have called the city clerk's office and our legislative council attorney resident to say, hey, we want to kind of steal some of the ideas that the Brockton City Council have done because you've done it right. So that's kind of where we are right now, Councillor. And, uh, you know, if, if anybody has any questions, we, you know, again, we, we've served and we're going to continue to serve and, and we'll answer the questions truthfully. Thank you. I'm going to quickly go over city finances. Um, I, I think as a former mayor, I tend to be more focused on finances because it's the underpinning of what you're able to accomplish in the city and, and uh, being able to sustain the level of services that our our residents not only expect but deserve public safety, libraries, especially the schools. Um, we as a council want to get a handle on city finances. We never know really what the level of state aid reimbursement will be until April and May. Uh, we never know what the economy will be in the country. Could it go up? Could it take a downturn? That obviously affects pension investments. Uh, we have a number of pressing borrowing issues, not the least of which is uh, money for school improvements. The North Junior North Middle School has to be completely renovated. Uh, there needs to be a new roof on the Huntington School. 
Uh, we will get reimbursement from the state, substantial reimbursement, but there will still be a, a city contribution towards whatever those expenses are. We do unfortunately have a judgment by a jury outstanding against the city for about $4 million. A gentleman won a case against the city for discrimination and retaliation. That's $4 million. So I guess in the next month or two, we'll be having discussions and we'll be asking for information about where are we with respect to borrowing, with respect to finances, with respect to what it might look like for the next fiscal year 2020. Um, so when we meet in May, I suspect we'll have a lot more information for you because we'll certainly have some preliminary figures out of Boston and we will share them with you and then collectively it's, it's challenging for the mayor to put together a budget and to try to have the services provided that we need and to add to services and uh, we'll all be very very much aware of where we are and what we can do by that time so that is a that is a very big issue um, we were asked the other evening to approve a 7.8 million dollar bond that will be uh, for wastewater treatment improvements under EPA guidelines. We have to make sure that the wastewater that we treat meets certain guidelines and this work does need to be done. Uh, that will be paid out of the, uh, water, the sewer enterprise account. Um, and so I, I guess in general I would like to reassure you that we do keep very careful focus on finances. Uh, some of you may remember in the 1990s Brockton came dangerously close to being, uh, I don't want to say insolvent, but, uh, uh, and I think bankrupt might be too harsh a word, but you know, we lost 35 firefighters, 31 police officers, including this gentleman here, Officer Healy. He was one of the officers laid off, and by the grace of the good Lord, and Jay Condon, who was our chief financial officer at the time, we were able to bring the officers back, including Bill Healy. Uh, we don't want to go through that again. We, we want to have stable finances, spend money appropriately, and allocate resources where they're needed. So that's my uh, portion of things. Uh, update on the Rock Stadium and the Shaw's Center. I don't know whether you want to do that at Council Ian Erie, which, whichever you... It's, it's in Ward 3, so... Thank you, Council. And uh, just in the last uh, uh, month or so, uh, as the situation occurred at the uh, Rock Stadium and the Shaw Center, we have uh, somewhat of a little bit of an issue there, and, and it being at the fact that the, uh, um, the the whole facility is closed at this particular time. But um, in, in talking, uh, not in talking, but in, in um, also viewing the, uh, the location with um, and fellow councils, I had a chance to view it, but uh, I, I was brought in first on it because I was still council president. Um, and, and I and the mayor and um, the building uh, 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 superintendent and, and others were, were involved in taking a quick tour um, to see what type of work that is needed to be done at the, um, uh, at the Rock Stadium as well as the Shaw Center. Not so much um, a lot of work to the Shaw Center, um, other than there are some areas where there were some roof uh, leaks naturally and uh, had done some uh, damage to the ceilings. Um, and even to a, a few of the walls. Um, the center in itself is pretty much in, in uh, a decent state of, of, uh, of mind other than uh, the carpeting that needs to be re replaced. And, uh, but it had been painted and had been uh, maintained in the, in the past year through the uh, 21st Century Corp, or B21 as they like to be commonly called. Um, uh, the kitchen, uh, believe it or not, um, I hate to say it, but probably saw its first cleaning in about six or eight years, um, and I mean thoroughly clean. So um, let some of us, um, you know, with our eyes open to like, uh, oh boy, um, you know, for the many functions that were held there, and it was never never cleansed the way that it should have been cleansed, but it, uh, it is, and just a couple minor things need to be tended to there. Uh, but when you get to the rock stick, um, to the stadium part of it, you've got some work that needs to be done. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's unfortunate, and this, Fortune, and uh, I know uh, Council Rodriguez uh, was with me the, on the last tour. He didn't become Council President. I was with him, and uh, he'd uh, he'd agree with uh, me when uh, we saw some of uh, the condition of what the uh, stadium in, it, in itself looked like, even the areas where the uh, you know baseball players would utilize as their locker rooms and, and other rooms within. Um, left both of us with our eyes open, like you know, how did this ever happen? You know who. And why wasn't it maintained? 
it left, left both of us with a little bit of a bad taste in our, in our mouths. And that's where some work needs to be done, as well as other. At this point in time, um, it is under the control of the uh, building department. Um, the building department has gone in and they've done some things just to secure it. Um, you know, right now, again, they're the ones that are in there trying to do some some of the other work within um, the area in the in the center in itself, and, and where the offices leaked and those types of things are being being done by our, our department. But at the same time, we've asked for um, somewhat of a, uh, I guess you want to call it a wish list of, of what needs to be done at the facilities, and and how we can get you know up and going. And um, I, I think at some point we're going to see that list, and then we're all going to have a chance to um, have discussion uh, at a council meeting as well. Um, and, and I want people to understand, and we have to make a few of our other city councils understand when people say, well, now it's ours. It's always been ours. The place has always been our location. It's always been an asset of the cities. It's the way it was bonded out and the way the agreement was made makes it look like, well, it was never ours. It is ours. And we can't let a piece of property like that just go the way that it's gone. We've got, we've got to figure out you know, how much is it going to cost so that we can get it up and going, and, and what do we do with it at that point going forth. And that's going to be the decision that's going to have to be made. So let's hope that we can get something happening um, in, the, in the center in itself, um, bring in some type of an outside agency that could come in and, and run it and, and market it and, and, and get it you know, different type of occasions back into the into the uh, uh, conference center area and, and, and keep that going at the same time. There's supposed to be baseball being played there this coming, um, you know, uh, late spring into summer, um, but still that doesn't end and this, you know, end and cure our woes. Um, it's still going to cost us, it's probably going to cost us two or three million dollars. More on the three million dollar track, I think, is what's been told to us to, to get this thing up and going again. So. We're going to be working on it, and um, you know, uh, again, I only, and I've always said it. It's our asset. We need to protect it. If if somebody came along and, and offered us an astronomical amount of money, well, then that's a different ballgame. I guess we look at it as a city and see what you know what will we do. But I don't think that's going to happen. So that's where we're at with that. But uh, if the building's secure, and the building inspector and his people are right now in charge of it. That's how the mayor had set it up. And, and that's where it's at, but um, you know, um, a lot of work does need to be done uh, done with it, unfortunately. Thank you. All right, next we're going to go, uh, trying to stay on schedule here, we're going to go to Code Enforcement, Public Safety, and I, I'm, I'm going to embarrass the next two people that I'm going to ask to uh, say a few words. I'll embarrass the captain first. Uh, Mark Picaro is commanding officer of all of the uniform personnel. He also earned a law degree, and he passed the Massachusetts Bar. Uh, I think that says a lot about his dedication to his professional development. I also think it says a lot for his time management skills, given his profession. So uh, we, we have an exceptional police department, exceptional fire department. That's just one example, and Bill Healy is another. Bill Healy and I served on the police department together. Um, thank God he was brought back because we were able to stabilize finances. Uh, yes, brought back during my administration, and uh, he has served for 31 years. He's very active in the city in terms of interacting with uh, homeowners, neighborhood watch groups. Uh, he's kind of the coordinator for all of that, but he also networks with the captain on issues and other police personnel. So uh, I, I think we're really very blessed to have people of this caliber in the police department. So without any predetermined topic, if the captain and Bill Healy would like to come up and just tell us what are some of the challenges you're facing, what are some of the issues that you think might be of interest to residents, and, uh, and we'll leave it at that. Uh, no, no special topic needs to be covered. You want to go first, Bill, or you want the captain? Uh, good evening. So um, this is a Q&A whenever I'm invited to the at large meetings. Uh, we have a few people in the audience. Um, and for our uh, viewing audience specifically, I want to let everybody know how they can contact me. And uh, the easiest way to do it is to just go to the Brockton PD website. Click onto the website, you'll see the business um, 
uh, Neighborhood Business Watch. Click onto that link and all my contact information is there. Um, my phone number, my email address, and what's very important to the people that live here is that, and I always talk about this because it's that important, the, uh, the tip line. And that tip line is national. I mean, it's local, but that uh, crime stop, as you're more familiar with, that's across the nation, and many bad people have been caught by crime stoppers. And so that people's mind at ease, when you log on to that and you want to drop a tip to law enforcement, that comes to me. I have no idea who the person is who's actually sending that message. <clears throat> it generates a number. No names, a number. I would have no idea. I would know it was you if you contacted my private email address or the Crime Watch uh, email address that we have. But the tip line, for those of you that don't want to speak to me or call me, the tip line just generates a number that's printed by me a few times a week, and those tips go to the chief. The chief delegates the tips to assignment. And like most of us here, most of us here in the city, we read the paper, and a lot of the um, drug busts that are made, the guns that are taken off the street, that comes from the, uh, from, uh, from the tip line. Very important, it's, it works, it's been, I think it's been around uh, 15 plus years. Um, so it's a good thing. I encourage everyone to use that. Um, again, this was a Q&A for me. When I, go to, when I go to people's homes or businesses, I'm also the Business Watch Coordinator, and I go on a monthly basis to Camp Pello Business Association meetings, Montello Business Association meetings, and the Downtown Business Association meetings. Again, they're all uh, monthly. Um, I attend all of those meetings, and any of the business owners that have any concerns, I address there. So it's easy, easier than in this type of a forum, because when I go there, I'm prepared, knowing who's going to be there and what, and what uh, questions are going to be asked. Here, just like when I go to Dennis's uh, ward meetings, it's difficult for me to answer some questions because unlike a residential uh, crime watch group, and there's many in the city, they address me before I attend a meeting. And I'm able to generate statistics for all of the streets in that watch group, which is why I'm a big fan of the neighborhood watch. So I go there knowing what streets I have to address and let the residents know what's going on in that neighborhood. Going back from the last time we met. So if it's a six month period in which we met last, I'll have six months worth of stats most of the time say 90% of the time, the stats that I generate and show eases those that live in the neighborhood. Takes away from all the nonsense they read in the paper that sometimes is overblown. So it's easy for me to do it that way, again, versus this way. So if this place was filled with 50 people, and Dennis is, uh, he's known for having like 35 to 50, well, all of his board meetings, and there's always a bunch of questions asked because there's just a lot more people to, to discuss this. The tip line is absolutely anonymous. People, yep. They can have full confidence that the information goes in and it's not just back. Yep. So it, it's like the counselor just said, it's, it's, it's so much anonymous, the tip line. Again, it just generates a number. I could communicate with that person. There's a back and forth if they have a, a question or concern. Um, but again, I'd be, I'd be talking to an 100% anonymous person. It's not a telephone number. Not a telephone number. So when you, when you log on to um, the link, the Neighborhood Business Watch, you'll see that um, address to either text or email. And it's very simple when you just ask some general information. Name of the person, aliases, uh, this description of, uh, of what, you've, what you've observed. But and I'm glad you mentioned it. <clears throat> Most importantly, for our viewing audience, people here, extremely important, do not use that tip line to address something that's happening at that time, such as a bank robbery. That's a 911 call. I know it's, it's hard to believe that I have to say it, but I do because I get tips all the time, uh, especially on the weekends, um, and I'll come back Monday at 4 o'clock to have five or six tips that talk about the Loud House Party. 
See, people in the city and in everywhere, generally, every across the country, they don't want to interact with the police. They, they're intimidated about calling because of in fear of what might happen. And so that's the type of thing you cannot address the tip line for. The, the tip line is uh, excellent for, as an example, um, drug dealing in a particular neighborhood from a particular home. So again, a lot of those raids that you see, that I think we do, the captain can talk on it, weekly, we're out there, the narcotics division is out there along with our SRT team, going in there into, in, into homes, grabbing drugs, grabbing guns. A lot of that comes from the tip line, and of course, informants. So, um, once again, do not accuse that tip line, and I have to emphasize that as much as I have to emphasize strictly anonymous, because I get tons of tons of emails regarding things that speeders, um, mostly disturbances that occur during the weekend, and the problem with doing that tip line thing, they're not getting a response from the police, and I hear it by going to meetings and whatnot. The police never responded. The police never come. The police never. And then I go and I generate those statistics to find out the police were never called. Maybe the tip line. And of course, if I, if I address the tip line two days after the incident, uh, incident that doesn't go to the chief because the incident is over. So be on top of that and uh, keep the tips coming. Um, any questions from anybody in here? Or the counselors? Maybe uh, the captain has anything to... Captain, you got anything to, like again, most importantly, I was here to let everybody know how they can reach me, very simple, and uh, any questions we got on the tip line and stuff. Thank you, Officer. Thank you, Council Fowler, for those kind words. I appreciate that. I'm Mark McCarr, I'm a captain with the Brockton Police Department. Like the council has said, I oversee the patrol division, and although I work 4 to 12, Monday through Friday, the patrol division is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so my responsibility extends. It's, it's always going. And I'm, I don't want to say I'm constantly getting calls or texts or emails regarding issues, but uh, there's always something going on when I'm off duty, and I don't mind that. But um, I really didn't have a particular agenda tonight, but uh, to, to answer Councilor Fowles, uh, one of his questions, he said, if I had any priorities for the upcoming year, I know in my role as the patrol commander last year, first full year in that particular role, the two big issues that have been brought to my attention are loud, loud parties, particularly in the spring and summer season, and the homeless issue downtown. So I've been trying to put something in place that the loud parties is something we can effectively deal with. It's a work in progress. I did some things last summer. I think it was a step in the right direction. I want to take another step this summer and hopefully, I don't want to say resolve the problem, but uh, my goal would be to charge more people, more of these homeowners that are having these loud parties, take them to court and resolve it there. As far as the homeless downtown, it is a very challenging issue from a police perspective. Um, there's only so much we can do as a police department with that issue. It's, it is the biggest social issue going on. Um, usually when we get called, it's because homeless people are on someone's property downtown or a business, and we're asked to move them along. And uh, usually that's what we do. We're encouraging businesses that have constant issues with homeless to put up no trespassing signs so that when we go down there, it gives us greater power, gives us a right of arrest if we choose to do that with, with some of these people. And uh, some of the businesses have actually taken our advice, so uh, that's a step in the right direction for us there. Um, Officer here, we spoke about the Crime Stoppers as a way to anonymously reach out to the police department with issues. Another good way, and I, I receive these, these emails almost every day is the C Click Fix app. If you go to the City of Brockton's website, there is an app on there called C Click Fix. And it stands for you see a problem, you click on the internet and the city fixes it. 
I get a lot of C-click fix issues sent to me regarding traffic problems, cars illegally parked or abandoned motor vehicles, uh, suspicious motor vehicles, drug issues, you name it, I get it. And I review them, I'll put calls in to have the patrol division go out and address it. If it's a drug issue, I'll send it to the, the, to the detectives. A lot of the traffic enforcement issues, I'll give to Captain John Hallisey, who's the traffic commissioner, so his unit can address it. So if you have any issues, uh, look at that C-Click Fix app. I believe you can either identify yourself or remain anonymous on that as well. So you don't have to, you don't have to identify yourself if you don't want to. I get a lot of anonymous uh, emails sent to me that way. Um, if anyone has any questions for me or issues, I'm all ears. What do you have now? I'm curious to know something. Um, Excuse me, ma'am. Can you use that microphone, please? <coughs> like that? Right behind you. Right behind you. Uh, born in Brockton, live in Brockton, families in Brockton, five generations. We live on Ash Street between Belmont and West Elm. And that's a very, um, we've had neighborhood watches for years, but we haven't done it lately. The first question is, what do you do if you suspect a house is being squatted in and possibly drug trafficking? You let us know. That's all? Yep, you let us know and if there, it, those two issues can either be addressed by the detectives or our code enforcement officer. Okay, what about zoning? Where, does it, where do we go if we have a question about zoning because it's affecting all the properties around it, some behavior or action? I think the zoning is more of a, maybe a council issue. So, a, in other words, we don't... Yeah. yeah, the question becomes ultimately for me, is it illegal what they're doing? And the question is, where do you begin? the activity. Yes. For example, if you think someone's operating a business out of their house. Like a boarding house? A boarding house or something like that. Start at the building department because they will check the zoning, then they'll interact with assessors, find out what that, what's the classification of that particular building, and then that will set in motion a review by the appropriate people. All right. And if, uh, as, well, I'm thinking of one property specifically. Um, the law requires a four foot high fence around a pool. This looks like a four foot fence, but a three year old could access through part of that broken fence. Is this all under the same umbrella, is my question. In other words. That I would go to the building department on that. They would right. most likely have a building inspector come out, take a look, and determine if the fence meets code. Uh, if it's something that carries over to the health department, they'll let them know. If it's something that goes to the assessors, maybe the people, you know, are operating an illegal boarding house. Oh, they are. Then, then, uh, but, but again, yeah, see Click Fix, you could use that and it will be rooted to the right people. Excellent, and one last thing. Um, we have a lot, we have absentee landlords, and that's a big problem for us. Now, our crime watch put a stop to the one nearest us um, in the past. Now, the crime watch, we have to reestablish the neighborhood. We have a lot of new neighbors. What about things like you suspect but are not sure? I hate to waste police time on something that is just a figment of my overexcited imagination. How do you find that out? It's the same house, by the way, and we have. We now have three absentee landlords in our section of street. Everyone is a problem. One has a roll off and rats. So now I've got a neighbor with a gun shooting rats. We're a densely settled neighborhood. Yeah, well, you, you, you can't fire a oh, weapon within the city, uh, even if it's scattershot trying to kill a, a rat. He, here's what I would suggest, uh, and I haven't been on the police department for a while, but if you think something is really not properly going on at a residence, I would keep a log for three or four days, maybe even a week, and, and keep a record of the time. For example, if you see multiple people in multiple cars coming and going out of a house, and it appears to be a boarding house, if you write down the dates and times, and if you actually can grab a few plate numbers, then you turn that over to the police. It kind of gives them a foundation to go over there and knock on the door so that someone can't say, well, you're retaliating, you don't like me, you're coming over here for a 
a spurious reason, but if you, if you give them something tangible to use, then they can go to that address and they won't mention your name. For example, uh, the captain or Officer Healy, they're not going to go over there and say, Mrs. So-and-so complained about you, we're here to look into it. They'll just go over and they'll knock on the door, make observations, find out if they're asked to come in, um, see if there's multiple mailboxes. Oh no, they're too clever. It, it's, uh, the I mean, traffic they, is wonderful. They, they know what they're doing, and uh, as do the building inspectors. And uh, again, document as much as you can, though. I think it's very helpful to keep a log because I can't remember last week what I actually saw at a specific <laughs> time and date. But if I have it written down, I can hand it over to the authorities. Well, I'm no longer working, therefore I have a new hobby. Thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I, I could be wrong, but maybe six, seven years ago, I might have been maybe to your home or somebody's beautiful kitchen. Yes. Like, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful old home, the kitchen, the kitchen was spectacular. And that, and that was like, but I was just impressed with how beautiful the home is. And that was probably six or seven years ago. And what's that? I, I can imagine. But, but, there's an, but there's an example of, um, I haven't heard from your neighborhood since. When I don't hear from you, why wouldn't it be? And so like um, Councilor Fowler was just saying, keep, keep us in the loop and we'll respond. And, and I did look into that home next door, as you know. So, yeah, but, but, we, but we didn't know about the problem. So, and you, and you have all my contact information. Nothing's changed. It's been the same email address for over a decade. So I just want to let everybody know that it was addressed and there hasn't been a meeting since. And, and most importantly, Kev, one more thing. I forgot to tell everybody, when you, when you click on to my address um, for, uh, for Crime Watch, when you link on to it, most importantly, if you want to um, uh, organize a neighborhood watch, You'll just you'll just send me you already know how to you'll just send me that email to say that you're interested and by way of the email I'll respond back on what you need to do. So I, I forgot to mention that at the beginning. Yeah. All right, thank you, Cap. Anything else? I just want one quick thing. Another thing to keep in mind is the city has something called the Quality of Life Task Force. It meets once a week over at City Hall. The mayor's in charge of it, but this task force has a the department head or a representative of the department head of all the city departments. So you have the building department, the board of health, the police department, the fire department, et cetera, et cetera. And they meet every week. And what they do typically is they discuss certain issues that have been brought to their attention. So if they have a problem address, a piece of property that's on the radar for whatever reason, they'll sit down and they'll talk about this and they'll try and come up with a game plan on having the board of health in the building department go pay a visit with a certain goal in mind. So if you have an address that's a problem, you know, if you bring it to our attention, it may not be 100% a police issue, might be part of Irish, but we can bring it to the Quality of Life Task Force's attention. We have a sergeant who weekly sits on this task force and he can bring it to their attention and they can kind of come up with a game plan on how to deal with it. And we may go out there and it might be, like you said, maybe nothing, but at least we're gonna go out there and check it out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Anybody else? All right, All right thank you. You can go to open forum now. Uh, oh, yeah, hold on, Bob. Uh, in terms of uh, boarding houses, uh, I actually ran into this several years back uh, in Wood, too, not too far from My parents live right near you. Um, but this was on Manaman Street, and same thing, I got a lot of calls from different people thinking it was a boarding house. So I, I did exactly what Councilor Fowler said. I you know, talked to the Board of Health, went to the building department first. And unfortunately, in this case, it was not a boarding, it was a sober house. And sober houses are permitted under federal law, they're protected. Um, people that are recovering are deemed as handicapped under the federal law. So you can't prevent a sober house in the city of Brockton, uh, town of Avon, they, they, they can go there. They don't need to give notice to any of the residents. So again, what Wynn said is 100% accurate. The starting point would be the building department to see what it's zoned for. 
and then trickle down effect from all the different departments. But I, I think without question that's something you should call tomorrow on. Thank you. I just like to um, just to bring up a little uh, follow up, and uh, I appreciate Captain McCall for being here this evening and uh, having his input. And uh, I'll probably be inviting you to my next uh, ward meeting because you haven't been to one yet, and I do want the, the people of Ward Three to uh, to meet who you are and, and just what you do. Um, and I had that chance of doing that uh, back uh, in the summer of 2017 when we had a very uh, difficult situation when we had a house party on Myrtle Street and you know how that all, uh, all, all ended which was not in the, the right way and it did the tragic way but um, you know we, um, we, we worked with the neighborhood there and uh, Captain Picardo was uh, one of the ones that had lead there that uh, was right on top of things and I appreciate that because it uh, it helped um, help change that neighborhood dramatically, and it had a new road put in just last year to the tune of almost uh, four hundred fifty thousand dollars, and uh, it changed that whole changed that whole neighborhood. Um, and there's some new people I've seen that have been moving in because it's close to me, um, and, I, and I drive it quite frequently. Um, and of course, I I, I want to uh, uh, definitely uh, commend Officer Healy for um, all that he's always done with the. Uh, the crime watches and, and uh, creating a neighborhood uh, watch groups because um, being in a ward, I think it's very important. And um, as he mentioned, he mentioned my ward, ward three. We have a we have a couple of uh, neighborhood groups that are still very active, and um, he knows because he receives phone calls from some of those people. And um, the one thing that um, you know he does is he does his follow up work, and, and uh, um, when they call me, I make sure that they've contacted him first because yes contact your ward counselor and let them know what's going on but I'm not the police department you know what I mean you need to make sure that they know um, the department knows what's going on they're, they're going to get there faster than I'm going to get there I might have a new hip but I'm not running around just yet but um, in any case I think it's important and, and one thing always strikes when it comes to my ward meeting is trying to get other groups to, to come forth and, and, and to come back into play because it's, it's something that's been missing over the last few years and, and our former counsel from Ward 4, uh, Counselor Stensky, who was uh, chief of police, always um, always believed in that. Uh, Mayor Fowler, Counsel Fowler will tell you that. It was one of the big things that they worked under under the Fowler administration was bringing neighborhood watch groups together. And uh, things do go away, but you want to bring them back. And I think it's time we need to be bringing them back. So um, I, I want to commend him and, and all that he does. Uh, because it, it is very important. It is very, very important that you watch out for one another and one another's neighbors, um, as, as, as you do, obviously. You're, you know, you're on top of things in, in your area, and it's nice to see a neighborhood that's maintained itself for 50, 60 years. So to try to stay that way. It's tough throughout the city for it to be the same, but you try to do that. It's the same in my neighborhood, where I'm in West Chestnut, Longwood Ave, in that area there. It still maintains itself. You know what I mean? Wooded Ave in Wyoming, it's all still a nice neighborhood, but there are new people coming into it as well. So um, I just want to point that out. So, you know, even to our uh, people who will be watching that, it's very, very important. And, uh, and Officer Healy is always ready to go and, and to set one up. So I appreciate his efforts all the time. Thank you. It is at this point I turn to our council president to uh, answer any questions or offer any comments or close things down for us. I know we're a little bit ahead of time, but it's all yours. Oh, thank you, Councillor. Um, I just wanted to, to, to kind of uh, voice what you, uh, what you just said in terms of, um, uh, of people getting involved. Uh, I think it's important. Uh, we have, Brockton is a city of 100,000 plus people. Uh, and I say 100,000 plus because uh, I know we're in the books for 95,000 or so, but when you sit down and think about it, the city of Lowell has 15,600 and something students in their public school system, and they're in the books for 108,000. We are at almost 18,000 kids in the public school system. How can we be at 95? Uh, you don't have to be an MIT professor to figure that one out. Uh, I worked somewhat with the census a couple years ago. I know what happened with people under-reporting. 
the instance of the house that you're talking about, if the census papers came, I'm sure those people are not going to fill out the papers saying that there's 20 people living in that house. They, they're probably going to say that there's four or five people. So that, that's what happens a lot of times. It's the under-reporting. It's not necessarily the no reporting. It's just the under-reporting. But people don't realize that that's actually costing us millions of dollars. Because the closer we get to the 100,000 uh, plateau, the more funding we get more help for the schools, more help for the police and the fire and everything else. So it's important for people that are, especially those that are watching us at home, to know that the census is coming around in a couple, in another year or so. Uh, and people need to know that by not filling it out properly, we're actually hurting this community. And we've been hurting this community for the last 20 or 30 years, because it happens every 10 years. And if we don't take the initiative to do it properly, it hurts us for 10 years. So it's a, it goes on as a long suffering. So I think it's important for all of us to do that. But it's also important for us to, uh, uh, although I said we're a city, uh, but we are a small city with a, a little town mentality in a sense. Uh, I mean, I hear it every day where we talk about the homeless people in the city. Uh, but people also fail to say that uh, being the only city in the county, we're, we're getting everybody else's stuff. Uh, if you are having a tough time in the Bridgewaters, where are you going to go for services? Brockland. If you're having a tough time in Brockland, the same thing is going to happen. So we're catching everybody else's uh, problems, basically. And when you look at the homeless population in this city, somewhere around 70% of the people who are homeless in Brockland are not from Brockland. They become our problem because once they come, they stay, and it becomes our problem. And it's up to us to do something to help them as human beings as well. But they're not from Brockton. Uh, but it becomes a problem for Brockton. It's the same um, uh, situation where you steal a car in Easton and you dump it in Brockton, it gets recovered in Brockton, it becomes a statistics for Brockton. And that sometimes is something that we face. It's the price that we pay for being the only city in the county. But I think it's important for all of us to, um, to remember that. And at the same time, not to be discouraged. Because I've said this many times that the politicians, members of the police department, the fire department, the teachers, sometimes we are our worst enemies. We are. We complain about things that are borderline uh, issues. We make a big deal out of sometimes nothing. Instead of looking at it and saying, well, I know that this is a problem. How can I work to fix this problem? And we tend not to do that too often in this community. Because I know that you know our paper doesn't help us a great deal because they're quoting things from um, you know from the surrounding communities. Or Easton is doing this, uh, East Bridgewater is doing this, uh, Avon is doing this, uh, Brockton is not doing this. Well, you know what? Brockton should not be put in the same sentence with Easton and Avon and the Bridgewaters. You know, when you look at we've got one of the best high schools in the state. Yeah, if you compare it to the high schools in the suburbs, we're not doing as well as the suburbs. But compare us to the high schools in New Bedford, Fall River, Boston, uh, Springfield, Worcester. You see how well Brockton High School does compared to everybody else. And I think it's important for us to realize that one, we're not living in a little city, in a little town. You know, this is a city. We have city problems, but the only way that these problems can get solved is by us working together to solve this. You know, you, for instance, picking up the phone, and you've got the, the two best contacts in the police department here the captain and the guy that actually handles uh, neighborhood watch. Uh, get in touch with them. Call them, get in touch with them, and help. let them help you out. Because it's not fear for you to be forced out of your neighborhood, because you're doing the right thing. Let the ones who are not doing the right thing be forced out of the neighborhood, you know? We had the issue um, uh, about a week or so ago with the, uh, with the police chase in the middle of the city and all that. Those people are not even from Brockton. They came in, robbed a store, and our brave men and women in the police department did their jobs well, very well, to apprehend the individuals involved. But again, it became news for Brockton, but it was not a Brockton issue. You know, our kids didn't rob the store, you know? At least this time they didn't do it, you know? And they were, you know, there was the police chase in the middle of the city, but I wasn't even here, I was in New York at the time, and you hear the you know, through the uh, social media and the phone calls that you get, oh, guess what happened in Brockton? Guess what happened in Brockton? 
and come to find out it's not even a, a Bronctonians that actually did that. But it becomes a black eye for us as a city. But I think what I'm, what I'm trying to get to is that uh, as a member of this government, which I now consider myself you know, being an elected uh, official in the city, I think we all owe it to everybody else in the city to do our parts to promote this city. There's so much good that happens in this city that we fail to talk about. I know it's easier to talk about all the other negativity that goes on everywhere. But when you look at, and I, I gotta go back to Brockton High, because I'm a proud graduate of that school, but when you have 4,600 kids in that one building, you know, think about it, 4,600 teenagers in one building. You should have issues on a daily basis. Think, we have two or three kids at home, and sometimes we wanna call the police on them on a regular basis because we can't deal with them. But wait, imagine 4,600, and yet you look at the school, the way it's done, the way it has progressed, the way it has achieved, you know, it's, it, it's, 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 it's beyond belief in a sense when you sit down and think about it. But that's what we need to talk about, you know, because we can't sit here and just beat the city to death because it's not gonna get any better. We have people sometimes that says, I'm, I'm leaving because I can't deal with this anymore. Well, I say this, when all the good people leave, guess who stays behind? The bad people. You know, so I think it's important for us as a, a community to basically honk down and basically say, look, you're not going to push me out of my neighborhood. You know, you're not going to come in here and, and violate the neighborhood the way you guys have been violating. And we're going to do something to deal with this. You know, I don't care what color you are. I don't care what language you speak. The idea is people, and 99% of the people in this city are law-abiding people, and they will do that. That 0.001% that's not, well, we need to deal with them. You know, that's why we have prisons. That's why we have uh, other places that people can be put on. And there's other communities that they can move on. You know, if they do not want to follow the rules and regs in our city, they shouldn't be here. But it's also important for us as a community to work together and band together to make our city even better. Uh, if we don't do it, it's not gonna happen. Uh, if we expect somebody from East to, to, to say nice things about Brockton, you got another thing coming. You know, from the surrounding communities, you have doctors who live in the outskirts of the city that come to our city on a daily basis for their living, talking crap about this city. You know, well, you're, you, it's like one time I remember I was in the Harrington administration and the, I got a call from a teacher, you know, they were negotiating the contract at the time and I happened to pick up the phone and the woman says, oh, you know, I love the children, I want you guys to support the teachers because we love the children, we love the children. So I asked her, where do you live? And she said, I live in Norwell. I said, well, gee, you love the children enough, but not enough to live with them. You know, so that's the, th that's the kind of stuff that we see all the time. You got people that live outside of the city coming in to benefit from what we have to offer in the community, and then they go back to their communities. But a lot of times we spent, or we aid them in the process of making the city look even worse by allowing them to talk the way they talk about our community. And I think we need to pull together as a community to, to change this entire mentality. Uh, I talked to the mayor just the other day and I said, we better see on the budget, on the budget this year some funds in there to promote this city. Not to hire people, but to promote the city. I was driving behind a bus in uh, one of the MBTA buses in Boston the other day and it was a big, uh, it had a big placard on the side that said, uh, come to Lowell for this, this, and that. And this is a bus in downtown Boston. Well, you know what? If Lowell is advertising at that level, why shouldn't Brockton advertise at that level? You know, we can't just be uh, a city that every single dollar that comes in gets spent on personnel or, or some of the other issues. We have to invest in this community, and investing in this community means putting some resources so we can get outside people to come in and help make Brockton a better city. And that's what I, at least I know from my, the colleagues that I sit with, um, you know, uh, I've said, I said this earlier today, I think, honestly, this is probably one of the better counselors and councils we've had in a long time. Not because I'm sitting in it or anything, but you know, we've got some great people uh, sitting in this, uh, in this council. Again, going to uh, the ordinance committee that we were just talking about, I think that ordinance committee was probably one of the better ones we've had in a long time. You know, uh, in terms of having individuals 
from a, a cross section of the city that understands problems that we face in this community. And I think the work that was done was was excellent. I mean, it was. I said it in the paper. I, we couldn't do, we couldn't have done it any better. You know, I don't think we could have done it any better. So that's something that people need to be proud of and uh, and understand that uh, we're here to make the city better, and we are counting on you to help us do it. Because I know from the guys that I'm in and the ladies that I sit with, uh, we're going to do our part to make sure that happens. Okay, I'm. Oh, I was going to introduce Councillor Ann Borg out from Ward Five. Yes. Uh, as we as we wind down, I'm 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 simply going to say for Bill Healy, Dennis Ianeri, Moises Rodriguez, Bob Sullivan, Darren Duarte, Captain Picaro, Mark Picaro. We're proud to serve you. We owe you our best efforts to make the best possible decisions for the residents, to spend money wisely, to take the time to examine issues, and to try to always do what's right. And uh, I, I, I'm proud to serve with all of you, and I'm proud to serve the city. I, I agree with you, Councillor. It's unfortunate. It's almost like that, uh, uh, I'm trying to think who did that song. It might have been the Eagles, Dirty Laundry. It seems like people focus on the dirty laundry, but they never look at the achievements or the, the pluses to uh, a particular place, and, and that's too bad. So uh, uh, I see Mr. Hersey might want to say something before I pass this over to Bob. Either that or if it's a real tough question. <laughs> I, I do have some questions for the council. Is this thing working? All right. My first question, well, first I want to say congratulations to Moses on his new position. New position, you're president of the council, okay? Uh, I gotta say my hat's off to the captain here with a great deal of respect. I knew he had a college degree, but I didn't realize he had a law degree, and he passed the bar. That's quite an accomplishment, and he's a captain. I mean, he's doing some serious work, so I have a lot of respect for him, I really do. I also have a lot of respect for you for having the guts and courage to stand up to the mayor in the, in the last meeting, because I know he gave some information that wasn't fair and, and not totally truthful, and you brought out the, the truthful things. I do have a couple questions for the council. The first one was, last summer the mayor said Provo was a great success, and because of it, new businesses are coming to Brockton, but nobody's... Mr. Jenkins, Mr. May, they haven't told us what great businesses are coming to Brockton. Do, do you people know? Could you give us an enlightenment on which, what these businesses are that are coming? I, I, I do know that I received a call from Mr. Jenkins today, and I have not had a chance to call him back, and he was going to update, I think, all counselors on downtown urban renewal, revitalization. So. I think the I think the answer to that is information pending. I assume. Okay, but nothing is. I, I don't have anything tangible. No. Yet. Oh, okay. All right. So nothing has nothing has been definite about coming to Brockton as far as job opportunities for people. Uh, I, Dennis, I believe uh, Council uh, Borgard actually filed a resolve. Uh, I saw that on the agenda of asking Mr. May. Yeah, you're, you're all resolved out. Uh, to actually have uh, Mr. May come in front of the council on a couple issues, and okay. I'm sure those issues will come. Okay, because as you said, we, we do need industry, we do need jobs coming to Brockton. We do need new businesses, we, we really, really do. You know, but the point you made about Brockton High School and the school system, I have to tell you people, Brockton High School is a great high school. I think it's the greatest high school east of the Mississippi. I really do. And it's an amazing place. It's a city in itself. We have the best music department I would put up against any high school in the country. Okay? The best athletic department I would put up against any athletic school in the country. All right? I, I could go on and on and tell you about the great foreign language department and, and the trips the kids take and what they can do. It's, it's an amazing place with, with great teachers and great kids. And you know, the bad misconception, as you say, Moses, look, 90, I'm gonna say 97% of the kids at Brockton High are good kids, they're normal. And 97% of the people in Brockton are normal. On the homeless issue, we have to take into account and remember something. There's a difference between being homeless and being a criminal and being homeless 
and not a criminal. Sometimes you have to handle these people with compassion and understanding. I mean, if they're breaking the law, that's, you know, the arrest has got to be made if it's serious. But we have people who are homeless because they've lost their jobs. They've, they've gone into depression, all right? They've, they've had families split up. And we've got to take that into account. So I don't look at, I don't look at homeless people as just scums. I, I really don't. You have to understand where they are in life and what's happened to them. And that's a very important thing to, to always remember. Uh, sometimes some people can be very cruel to them and they don't deserve it because they're not criminals. Then even some of them who are alcoholics and drug addicts, they're not criminals. They're, they may spend their money on alcohol and drugs, but they're not dealing drugs. They're not doing, you know, they're not breaking into houses or breaking into cars. We've got to keep that in consideration. Uh, another question I want to ask you people is this. It's about Aquaria. I, I, I just don't understand, you know, last June, the representatives from Aquarius said that they had a new type of contract with the mayor. And I didn't know that he, that he they could just, the mayor could sign contracts, all right, sign contracts with Aquaria without going through the city council. It's, it's really mind boggling. And, and, and I don't understand that. So my question is, when are we going to get the information on that to find out if the mayor did over his, extend his authority? And if he did, are we going to sue him? Like we, like we have a court case going against him with the uh, power plant. If he did, and I don't know if he did or he didn't, and I want to make that clear. But if he did, something's got to be done. It's got to be stopped. And also, I, I think the city council has got to... Stop letting Mr. Nezzarella just spend money, spend money, spend money on outside counsel. There's got to be a figure every year to say, okay, you need outside counsel, 100,000, 150,000, because if not, we could wrap. Don't forget, it's not just the Russell Loeb's case. This, this is going to be a class action lawsuit. This could go on and on and on and on, spending money on outside counsel. It's got to stop. You've, the city council has got to say, we're going we're gonna to give 200,000 a year maybe to outside counsel, and that's it. Maybe Mr. Rell Mr. Nazarella is going to have to start defending some of these cases. And that's a very important thing. But I would really like to know about Aquaria. All right? It's really, really important, all right, for the people to know. Because if Aquaria got up there and lied, I think that's grounds in itself. To, to, they violated the contract. Or are they offering a lousy $455,000 because they can't pump what they're supposed to pump in the contract? All right? If that's true, we can get out of the contract there. And that's $6 million a year we can save. We haven't tested Aquaria yet. Can you pump this? Why can't we make them pump for 30 days? For 30 days, all out. See if they can. See if there's breakdowns all over the place. We have to know that. Because I, I don't think they can do what they're supposed to do in that contract. We're wasting a lot of money. $600,000. How much? $6 million a year we're paying them? Something like that? That's crazy. Now, on the 21st century, some of you people voted not to cut them. And they're the ones responsible for the Shaw Center. They were supposed to be run. They, they hired people to run it. I'm not going to ask you a question. Does anybody have any idea how much the, Sh the Shaw Center owes the city? I'm hearing like three, four $400,000 in water, electricity, taxes. I mean, I don't know. How much money do they, how much money do they owe the city? The rocks. Are you done with the questions? Or you got more? I'll sit down now. Because I know you want me to shut up <laughs> before I get the hook, before the police officers escort yeah, no, me okay. out the door. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, no. Uh, I, I think one of the things that you'll see probably within a month or so, uh, we've, got, we've got some plans to deal with Aquarium. Uh, and we've got that in the works. We also have something in the works to deal with the, with the Russell uh, Lopes issue. Uh, there was a resolve that was filed again with, uh, with the Queen of Resolves. but. Um, we are going to be dealing with that, uh, perhaps not in a very public way, uh, because it's uh, it's litigation, and we can't just you know broadcast uh, that as we. Are, but we do have a plan to deal with that. Uh, and the Shaw Center, I think, uh, Council I here kind of touched on that. Uh, right now, uh, we're more focusing on uh, saving that uh, that valuable resource that we have. Uh, you know, again. Uh, speaking in a city of 100,000 plus people, isn't it a shame that we don't have a facility in the city that handles a minimum, let's say 500, 500 people, 
You know, we don't, and it's a shame. So we do have that resource there, a valuable resource that we need to bring back online to do what it's supposed to do. And that's something that we're gonna fix it first, do what we need to do to bring it online, and then we're gonna deal with the issues because it was our property from, from the get-go always. You know, so no matter how, you know, the, you hear the rocks, the Shaw, the Shaw Center, the rocks, you know, it's always been City of Brockton. So it's our responsibility to fix it because it belongs to you, it belongs to me, it belongs to all of us. So we're gonna do that and move forward with that. And, and pretty soon you're gonna hear, then we're gonna go back and digging and see who owes what, where, and why. But right now what we need to do is safeguard that, uh, that resource that we have. You wanna add? And, and so in answering the questions that you had, we do have some things in the works that's probably going to take you know a couple months or so for us to you know you know get our grip on this, but we will uh, be dealing you know especially you know Bob and I have been uh, beating uh, Aquaria up now for at least what six years, and uh, we've gone to a point where we even cut that budget down to a dollar. Remember a couple years ago, uh, so we're not afraid of going after Aquaria, and we will continue to go after Aquaria because we have. You know, resources are not very abundant in this community, so it's almost $7 million, by the way, it's not just $6 million. So when you're spending that kind of money just for the right to have water, it's not even to get water. So when you say have them pump 4 million gallons a day, if they pump 4 million gallons a day, we're going to have to pay for it. Because that's almost $7 million. It's almost like a membership fee. We're not getting water for $7 million. That's just to have the right to have water. So that's something we're looking into uh, and probably within the next couple months or so, you're gonna hear some things, some steps that we are taking as a city council to deal with that. The Rock Center, if that's ours, where was the health department all those years that that kitchen was deteriorating? I think it's a fair question. And that place ran very well, but when the manager there left, it went to hell in a handbasket. We saw the same thing happen at Brockton High when we lost the brass handle. It's about the oversight of the health department. Nobody else. You're, and you're correct on that as well. And, and, and where, where was the health department in regards to checking the kitchen? I'm not too sure, you know what I mean? Uh, unfortunately. Right, exactly. And, and for how, the, how it all ran, um, you know, when it started some 15 years ago, and, and I was on the school committee then, and naturally we deeded the property over, um, you know, to the mayor, which was mayor units at that point in time, so that facility could be built. And um, it, was, it was built based upon legislation because it was built as a corporation. You know what I mean? It, it had a, had a little bit of a sidestep, similar to the way the same way the Plymouth County um, Correctional Facility got built. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it had a waiver, and, and there was a little bit different type of control there. Um, but I always said, and these, and these are my own words, and my own opinion, that I always said that that, that would always end up being just a, a gimmick that would last 10 or 12 years, and that's just about what it lasted, if it lasted that long because we've been without a team for how long? You know, it's been six, seven years since we've been without a team. But I agree with you, where, where was everybody? And like I said earlier, Council Rodriguez will, you know, our Council President would attest to um, the fact that when we ever saw the condition, I mean, it was just like unbelievable. It's but disgusting. let me just get back to that because as far as I can I can see, and last year we were close, uh, some of us counselors, and, and supporting the fact that we, we want to do away with 21st century core. And you know, so I'm not afraid to say that, you know, I, and I'm hoping other councils will follow. You know, the 20, 21st century corp was created, was created back when, um, again, I go back to uh, Council Fowler when he was mayor. And it was when, with difficult times, and it was based upon what what uh, uh, copy of, of method, the same as what they used in the, in the uh, city of Quincy. And it was formed on that same type of a tone, to have a corporation, bring in business, you know, make make our downtown different and everything like that. And, and to me, I have never seen where they have ever brought in any type of any type of um, business in itself. Small business, yes. I don't want to say there were some great ladies and gentlemen that served on the boards, and, and it was a volunteer work. But where did anyone ever go out and find an anchor 
and I mean an anchor, to give this city every year seven or eight, nine million dollars, we probably wouldn't be in the position that we, we were in even some years ago and even today. But has that ever happened? No, no. And, and you know, that's what always bothered me. So I think this year um, you're going to see where the 21st Century Corp could be something that could be just dismantled in itself. And I already spoke to the mayor about that before I left as being city council president. That, you know, I think time has come. You've got an economic development department in place. You're supposedly doing all these things of revitalization for downtown. Then those, then those people involved in that department and, and within his office should be the ones that should be continuing to move the city forward, as well as the city council. So 21st Century Corp, I think, is something that's gonna go by the wayside. That's the way I look at it. I hope we, we, we get his budget. We can, we can, you know, take things out of the budget as well, as much as we have to take from the bottom line. But we can, we can dismantle. So that's the way I'm looking at it, and, and I'm hoping other councils will follow suit. So, thank you. Council of Oregon. Hi. Uh, first of all, uh, sorry I'm late, but uh, this is a busy night, and I want to bring up a, f a couple of things. Yes, I did file a resolve. I want to make it perfectly clear, and this is going on record, that the new chair of the board of B21 is looking forward to turning all of this around. His name is Dan Evans. He is the president, CEO of Evans Machine, which I'm biased, is in Ward 5. <laughs> and um, it keeps on growing keeps on hiring people and keeps on contributing to the economy. And his reason is he wanted to give back because when it was first started by Wynn Farrell, he was able to take advantage of part of a program with B21, and we've been calling it B21 for a little while now. And uh, yes, so I did file a resolve for that because I believe that as citizens of the city, you have the right to know what's going on. And quite frankly, since most of the city council wasn't privy to what was going on, uh, that's, that's uh, you know, uh, this poor gentleman just came on in July, June, the end of June, and uh, he's, you know, willing to work with everyone. He's, he's, he said he wants to be totally upfront and totally transparent, and he only, we all have to gain from, how would I say it, turning this around. So that's one thing. Two, yes, I did file another resolve because I'm really having a little bit of a hissy fit about the whole thing with the Ganley building and that block because so, a couple of the businesses there, I never knew there was such a thing as a party wall. Apparently they can build two buildings with one wall. Blows my mind. And um, when they demolish it, well, imagine that. That's a little bit of an issue. So there are some tremendous concerns there. And that is, how would I say it? kind of a focal point because people are coming down 123 and what have you. So yes, we're, we're going to hear information on those particular matters in some way, shape, or form. And in, in respect to the late Carl Landerholm, who spoke in front of ordinance last year around this time to create a historic commission that would be include the historic district commission in protecting the history of this city and a lot of the great buildings, et cetera, we're hoping to hear a little bit more about that. And I did file the Lopes one again, so people can be aware that at any time we're trying to be as transparent as possible, educate you as much as possible. It's your hard earned money that keeps the city going and it's a challenge. On another note, I, I was at a BHS alumni meeting because the late Carl Landholm was the president and it's one of the reasons why I'm late and um, what the BHS alumni does, and we're looking for nominations for people that have been graduates of Broughton High and have excelled in their profession, and uh, also for individuals that have done a great deal for whether it's the community or for nonprofits. And last but not least, for our wicked, wicked young people that have just graduated within the past 10 years or less and have you know, sought to do you know, make changes whether in their profession or excel in some capacity. And uh, that those um, awards are given out at the same time as three scholarships in uh, the last week of May, first week of June. And also I wanna let you know two other situations that are going on that don't cost anybody any money. For a lot of people, they want to have their taxes done or need assistance with that. It's free on Mondays at the Broughton Main Library. I'm not gonna lie to you, people start lining up two hours before they get there and they will help you with your taxes. 
and particularly they, they help the disabled and seniors and you know other you know individuals with income challenges and people it's like from three to eight o'clock or so okay and they're there at mass assort on Saturday mornings at nine o'clock in the morning I think they're in the student union building but the information is made available again again this does not cost you anything these people are educated professionals they know what they're doing and they've been doing it for years so that's one thing and two the tree people are back DCR Department of Conservation and Recreation and they did their pre one of two presentations last night and people from the south side they put up they planted 1,400 trees last year in the city of Brockton. And this doesn't cost you a dime. And if you're living from Brookside Street, Brookside Ave, excuse me, on and in between Montello and uh, Manomat and going forward to School Street, so that they have a map and what have you, and you have 40 trees to choose from, and they will put them on your house, as you know, on your property, forgive me, and you know, as many as can be provided and they want to do it more on the residents than on public property and they will help you with through the whole thing so I just want to let people know about that because there's a whole lot of positives that go on in Brockton there's a whole lot of services in this city provided by agencies for people in the city and throughout Plymouth County and actually bordering on Bristol County and Norfolk County and people need. So that's really important. And um, I want to thank these guys for doing this. It's tough to do your first meetings in the winter because everyone's still, you know, recuperating and it gets dark early and what have you. But uh, thanks for coming out this evening. Thank you. Okay, before I go to Bob, we will make sure we share information on Aquaria, on the various issues involving the Rock Center, uh, the, the Shaw Center, and the Rock. All of us up here, all of the counselors here tonight, believe in transparency. Uh, some people don't like it, we like it. And one of the things you mentioned when you became council president was share more information, not less. Give us everything you've got, let us process it. It will help us make the right decision. So now batting cleanup is Councilor Lodge, Robert F. Sullivan. So I, I've been on the city council 14 years as a counselor at large, and I always say this, you have your ward counselor, but every single day you have four at larges. So at any given time, you have five counselors out of the 11 that will work with you and for you. We're public servants, we serve the public. Uh, and I do want to thank Captain Picaro. I've known Mark since we were students walking this school together in the 80s. And, uh, and of course, uh, Officer Healy, since I've been on the council, they're honorable men. What they say is their word, and, and they'll get it done. So again, they come here uh, because they want to serve you, uh, and that's their job. But they're also Brocktonians. They live in the city. So give them a buzz, I mean, if you have an issue. But also give us a call. I mean, call Moses. You can call Dennis, even though he's in a different part of the city. He likes to be <laughs> called. Uh, and again, you have me, you have Wynn, and then Gene, who's, who's under the weather tonight. But again, thank you for being here. We're going to have another one in May. We're going to keep it up. But, you know, give us a buzz if you hear anything. I want to thank Councilor Borogat for being here. She's like the quasi-fifth Councilor at large because she likes to be around the city. But again, thank you very much. God bless. Thank you.